Hey folks, uh, it is Dr. Gilchrist and we are starting to change tack on um, our biopsych. So we spent the first unit of uh, this class talking about the different parts of the brain and the nervous system and how they work and how they interact with each other. Uh, we spent the second unit talking about our different sensory and motor systems. And now we're kind of shifting gears a little bit and we are going to be talking about learning and memory. Memory. So the first thing that we are going to talk about is how learning happens in the first place and what learning is. So it's really, really tempting to think that learning is really nothing more than what you're learning in class. But learning is much more general than this, and it's much more involved than you would think it is. So we believe that all learning is associated with functional and structural change in the nervous system in some sort of way. So that includes things like objects, faces, sounds, feelings, uh, a very simple type of learning. So for example, noticing that this face is your mother's face. And so this would be a case of um, perceptual learning. So knowing faces, knowing words, learning sounds, all of these will involve the sensory systems. The next type of learning that if you've had general psychology, odds are pretty good you've heard about, is stimulus response learning or what we call associative learning. Typically, when we talk about this with respect to the nervous system, you are typically involving some type of a motor response, as you might see in classical conditioning, or you're learning a relationship between two different types of stimuli. So for example, a green light functioning as it's time to go. Now, relational learning is much more complex than perceptual learning or stimulus response learning. Um, and this is the kind of learning that we tend to think about when we think about our memories. So, for example, if I show you a photograph, it might trigger your memory for different types of sounds, different types of words, different types of smells, or uh, the details of an event. And there are lots of other types of learning besides these. Um, Many of these do overlap with each other. So for example, social learning is, it basically involves learning behaviors from conspecifics of the same species. So learning about how to behave and how not to behave by watching other people or other members of your species. So this might include food gathering and things like tool building. And it's pretty complex and it might be uh, a little bit related to relational learning. But for this particular unit, we're largely going to focus on these three. So one of the first things that you need to know is that all learning begins with neurons. Um, and this is largely from the work of Donald Hebb back in 1949. Uh, he was a Canadian psychologist and he ended up developing a theory of how functional and structural changes in neurons ultimately support learning. Now, scientists thought that neural changes were occurring, but it's really Hebb that proposed the first model of learning through changes in the synapse, the, the gap between a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. So in particular, according to Hebb, learning occurs through sustained activation and firing of what he referred to as cell assemblies. These are connected groups of neurons. Um, I typically will refer to these as neural networks. And so changes in the synapse, or what we would call synaptic plasticity, ultimately supports learning. And so the more these activations are associated with perceptions and they're initiated, the stronger the synapses between the neurons become. They fire more efficiently, and this is actually long lasting. And it's been suggested that this could be the key to forming new long term memories. Um, a key to this theory is that the networks have to be what we call plastic or capable of change. Now, at the time, Hebb didn't really know what kind of change that was, but he believed that there was some kind of structural or functional change. And this led to the development of what is referred to as Hebb's rule. 
Um, when an axon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it, some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells such that A's efficiency as one of the cells firing B is increased. Or to put more simply, inputs that fire together wire together. Now, we know that this theory is more or less correct, but at the time, this wasn't exactly something that you could test. We didn't have the techniques to study neural networks in vivo or in vitro. Um, now, what's especially important about this rule is how general and parsimonious it is. It could support many different types of learning. And here's what's really critical. You have the mechanisms available for uh, learning, but you don't necessarily need to grow new neurons to do that. You're, you've got the neurons you've already got, and they're capable of sustaining learning without growing new ones. And more definitive research that helped confirm this rule came later in the 1960s. So a lot of the work that has been done on learning and memory has largely examined cells in the hippocampus. Um, this comes from the Greek for seahorse or horse monster. Um, as you can kind of see here, here is a mythical creature on a Pompeii fresco. Uh, compare that to the modern day seahorse. And then take a look at the actual structure of the hippocampus here. It's very, very curved, much like the body of a seahorse. Um, part of the reason that a lot of work is done on the hippocampus, as you can kind of see, it's located just on the inside of the um, medial temporal lobes, that makes it very easy to find and very easy to isolate. And as we will talk about later, this area, it turns out, is really important for memory. And a lot of what we know about how memory works and how memory works in the brain in particular is based on looking at lesion studies of people who have damage to the hippocampus, such as HM. So here's kind of what this looks like um, in um, a human brain. So right now we are looking at a coronal cut of the brain and you can actually see that the hippocampus is incredibly easy to find. It's located right here and you can see me circling that with my cursor. Now let's talk about the structure of the hippocampus because it turns out that it's made up of smaller subcomponents. And these subcomponents are based on different types of cells and different types of connections. So the hippocampal region as we know it is made up of the dentate gyrus, which is right here. Um, what we call area CA1, all the way through CA4. Um, you do not have CA4 here um, or CA2 for that matter, but you can see CA1 and that goes all the way down to CA2 and CA3, CA4. And then um, a region that is called the subiculum, your book calls that the subicular complex. So the hippocampus again is made up of what we call the dentate gyrus, CA1 through CA4, and the subiculum. Now, if you want to be incredibly technical, the hippocampus proper is just made up of CA1 through CA4. Now, CA here stands for cornu amonis, um, meaning Ammon's horn, based off of the Egyptian god Ammon, who had the head of a ram. Now, in terms of connections, as you can kind of see in this figure, uh, we have this area here called the entorhinal cortex. That's going to project all the way up to the dentate, which then projects to CA3, which you see here, which then projects to CA1, which projects to an area called the fimbria. Um, at this point, once you've gone through this entire loop, information then can be sent to the cortex. So the fimbria is up here. That can make contact with the septum and the mammillary bodies and make contact with the cortex in general. So we're going to talk about two major pathways that are involved in this. So we have what is called the perforant pathway, which is basically the entorhinal cortex to the dentate. And then we have what is called the Schaefer pathway, which basically runs from about CA3 
to CA1. And it's these perforant pathways and the Schaefer pathways in particular that show plasticity. So really quick, here is Amun. You can see his ram's horn. You can see that that is very circular, much like the hippocampus is. So one of the things that's kind of cool, you can actually keep the hippocampus alive for several days in fluid that resembles extracellular fluid and oxygen. So um, this can either be done in vitro or in vivo. So here we have a hippocampal slice. Now, how we typically study uh, learning and memory formation in the hippocampus is by in, um, inserting a stimulating electrode into certain parts of that hippocampal slice and then recording from a different region. And what's kind of cool here, you can actually see the different cell densities for the regions here just by looking at the different shades in that hippocampal slice. So one of the first confirmations of Hebb's rule came from Terje Lomo in 1973, who observed electrical changes in the hippocampus. And here's kind of how they did it. They first started by stimulating the perforant pathway, which is right here, in the rabbit, which led to changes in groups of cells in the dentate gyrus. So we, were, uh, we stimulate the perforant pathway and we record from the dentate. So this uh, stimulating, um, this stimulating, ex, uh, this stimulating um, pipette is basically going to release an electrical pulse, or it can release several in rapid fire succession. So the idea here is if I deliver one electrical pulse um, in perforant, um, perforant axons in these neurons that will release glutamate and we'll see an EPSP, an excitatory postsynaptic potential from cells in the dentate. In the dentate. Now, what's especially interesting is that if you deliver a bunch of pulses to these axons in rapid fire succession, like da -da 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 -da, um, one of the things that we will find is that if you deliver a high frequency train of pulses, that will actually produce a larger and longer lasting EPSP than compared to one single pulse. So, oh, I went backwards. So here's what Lomo actually found. So here you can see a group of population EPSPs. They kind of look like EEG activity. And these are based on activity from many different groups of cells. Now, what you should be able to notice is that after I deliver a high frequency train of electrical pulses, you'll notice that the EPSP is much, much uh, larger and it stays that way for a long time. So here's before we introduce that high frequency pulse train. And then notice how much larger that is over a period of 96 hours. It stays that way for a few days. And what's cool about this methodology is that you can do this with preserved tissue, as I kind of showed you with that hippocampal slice, or you can actually do it in living animals with electrode implants. Now, in addition, so this original study looked at activation in the perforant pathway to the dentate. You can also get this with the Schaefer pathway, which is basically made up of cornu MS1 through corno MS3. So what you're looking at here, we have our stimulating, um, we have our stimulation uh, occurring right around CA3 in the Schaefer pathway, and we're gonna record from CA1. Um, so again, um, we're going to introduce a test stimulus. In this particular instance, we're going to either give one train of pulses or we're going to give four in rapid fire succession. And so uh, what you can see on the y-axis down here, 
Um, sorry, that little pop-up thing showed up and I'm not thrilled about that. What you kind of see on the y-axis, you can actually see the slope of the EPSP from a population of cells in CA1. And these changes are relative to the control, which is an EPSP after one pulse only. So this is how much percentage it changed uh, compared to one single pulse before we introduce these trains. And what you can kind of see, if you do those four trains, you can see that overall um, we get the largest LTP um, and compare that to one train, you can see that there's definitely some enhanced activity, but certainly not as much as you would see for four. Now, once this little menu bar goes away, you can actually see that this activity is sustained for a full 210 minutes after those pulse trains were uh, initially delivered. So this is something that actually lasts more than four hours. So, um, what this tells us is that, um, again, LTP or long-term potentiation, which we will talk about soon, um, is present both in the perforant pathway as well as the Schaefer pathway. So the question becomes, what is this long-term potentiation and what causes it? So we have to start by talking about glutamate. Glutamate is going to be absolutely critical for learning and for memory formation. So we've mentioned glutamate in the sensory system, but it turns out that it's a critical ingredient for long-term learning. And there are two different types of receptors that are actually gonna play a role in LTP in the synapses. The very first ones are what, are we, what we call AMPA receptors. That stands for alpha amino 3 hydroxy 5 methyl isoxazole propionic acid. Um, that's a mouthful, just call it AMPA. Um, so AMPA receptors are basic sodium potassium channels and they are critical for EPSPs. Um, your book doesn't really talk too, too much about them, but they're really critical for EPSP formation. The other type of receptors are what are known as NMDA receptors. NMDA stands for N-methyl D-aspartate, now these are calcium channels um, and two things need to simultaneously happen for NMDA uh, channels to actually open. Glutamate needs to bind to the receptor and the postsynaptic neuron needs to partially be depolarized. Um, and part of the reason for this is because at rest, at negative 70 millivolts in this neuron, uh, magnesium actually blocks the channel. So if you don't have that slight depolarization and if glutamate doesn't bind, NMDA uh, channels aren't really letting in much calcium otherwise. So calcium is what triggers the action potentials and allows the LTP to occur. So here's kind of what this looks like with those NMDA receptors. So glutamate is binding, but we need to have the cell slightly depolarized because you can kind of see that at rest, we've got this magnesium and as a result, calcium can't enter. Now, on the other hand, if the cell is slightly depolarized, that kicks out the magnesium block and it allows calcium to enter the cell and exert change. Now, here's what we know. We know that NMDA receptors are absolutely necessary for LTP to occur. And the reason that we know this is because researchers can take a hippocampal slice and they can apply uh, a, a chemical called AP5. AP5 is an antagonist of NMDA. So what this means is that it basically blocks the receptor from doing its job. Um, so we apply this receptor antagonist to a hippocampal slice. We apply that high frequency train of pulses to the perforant pathway. But because we've applied this antagonist, because we blocked the NMDA receptors, we do not get long-term potentiation. We also know that calcium is necessary for long-term potentiation. So again, 
we take a hippocampal slice. In this case, we inject EGTA, which is ethylene glycol tetracetic acid. That's designed to reduce the amount of circulating calcium. And then we apply that stimulation to the perforant pathway. And once again, we get no LTP. So it's kind of clear here that we need both calcium and these NMDA receptors to do their jobs. So how did these neurons depolarize in the first place? In order for the NMDA receptors to become out, uh, activated, allowing calcium to flow into the cell, the membrane has to be depolarized. So how does this happen? All right, so this is a little bit of a complicated figure, but don't worry, we're gonna walk through it. So what you're looking at here, we are looking at two neurons in the Schaefer pathway. So we've got CA3, and we've got CA1. So here we've got our presynaptic cell, here we've got our postsynaptic cell. So in this particular case, the presynaptic neuron is going to release glutamate, as you can see here. Glutamate will bind to our AMPA receptors, and what we will find is that when glutamate binds to AMPA receptors, um, that allows the channel to open, Sodium will rush inside of the cell, as we've talked about before, and potassium will leave. And because there is greater sodium influx than potassium efflux, we get a slight depolarization of the cell. At this point, the NMDA receptor is still being blocked by magnesium. Now, what happens after this? Now, here's what's really critical. You have to have the depolarization from those AMPA receptors first. Otherwise, the cell can't depolarize and the NMDA receptors will not work. So this slight depolarization will kick out the magnesium from NMDA receptors. So you can see there was our magnesium block. Here it is leaving the cell. So at this point, glutamate will bind to both NMDA receptors as well as our AMPA receptors, and we will start to get a calcium influx via these NMDA receptors. So calcium triggers effects in the postsynaptic neurons in the dentate gyrus and also in CA1 in the Schaefer pathway. Now, you can see here that this is kind of a complicated chain that calcium enacts. Um, we will talk about this in more detail very, very soon. Um, but generally, one effect that you can actually see here, why did you do that? It's because I clicked on you. Um, one of the effects that you can actually see is that calcium increases the number of AMPA, AMPA receptors. So this is really important. We have another AMPA receptor that glutamate can bind to. So this is a case where increasing the number of receptors in the postsynaptic cell actually strengthens the synapse and makes it more responsive to glutamate. Now let's talk a little bit more about the different effects that calcium exerts on postsynaptic cells. So calcium is very important for synaptic transmission. One of the things that we talked about very early on is that neurotransmitters require a flow of calcium because they are what allow synaptic vesicles to dock. They're also very important for contraction of the muscles. So calcium has many different effects that act to facilitate long-term potentiation. Some of these occur in an early phase, several hours after that pulse train that uh, creates LTP. And this is really the first phase. So the first thing that we will see is that calcium will bind to calmodulin. And as a result, this will bind to CAM kinase 2, which is an enzyme. Remember that if it ends in A's, it's an enzyme. CAM kinase 2 will then phosphorylate AMPA receptors. Uh, phosphorylation basically means that we are increasing the activity of proteins. And um, because it's phosphorylating these receptors, it helps move AMPA receptors to the postsynaptic density.
Now, how exactly the movement of the AMPA receptors is accomplished is still not entirely clear. But what we do know is that this creation of more AMPA receptors helps strengthen the synapse. We have larger and longer EPSPs to single pulses as a result. A stronger synapse will have more AMPA receptors and a larger response to glutamate than a weak synapse will. Now, what about what happens after a few hours? At this point, we are in the second phase of long-term potentiation. So this is a few hours all the way up to forever. Um, there are lots of different proteins involved here, lots of different hypotheses. This is still a huge area of research regarding what these proteins do and they're spread throughout the neuron or are they localized to the synapse. But here's what we know. CAM kinase 2, in addition to creating AMPA receptors, will also phosphorylate postsynaptic enzymes in protein synthesis. So not only does this create new AMPA receptors, it also creates new NMDA receptors. It also creates what are called dendritic spines. So dendritic spines are little areas of growth on dendrites so that you can have more surface area and uh, you can have more areas for receptive receptors to uh, actually grow. Um, and so these spines help increase the surface area um, by adding these little extra bumps to the dendrites and thus it creates more opportunities to receive glutamate. So dendritic spines allow calcium to exert more of an effect. It also increases production of nitric oxide, or NO. Um, nitric oxide basically serves as a retrograde messenger. What this means is that it travels from the postsynaptic cell across the synapse to the presynaptic cell. And it's believed that nitric oxide enhances glutamate release in the presynaptic cell. Now, this is something that is hypothesized, but not 100% proven. So here's what this kind of looks like. So here we've got our calcium. It is binding to uh, calmodulin, which binds to CAM kinase 2. Um, that creates new receptors. We also have our retrograde signal. So here we have our nitric oxide that travels all the way back to the presynaptic cell, and that enhances glutamate release. So what ends up happening in late long-term potentiation is that not only do we see postsynaptic effects, we also see presynaptic effects as well. So not only does our postsynaptic cell become a better receiver, of glutamate with these extra channels and these extra dendritic spines, our presynaptic cell actually becomes a better sender of glutamate. So here's kind of another way to look at this. So here's kind of our initial state. So here we have some molecules of calcium. We have our glutamate release. We have our receptors. Uh, after repeated stimulation, we get a long-term potentiation. And over time, you can actually see greater glutamate release in the presynaptic cell, greater receptors, and a greater calcium influx. So we see more presynaptic vesicles, more glutamate release with each action potential, Potential, and thus, we get a larger response in the postsynaptic cell due to more AMPA receptors and the increased likelihood of NMDA activation and calcium influx. So here's kind of a quick review. So we have two different phases of LTP. We have early LTP, which lasts between one and five hours, and it only exerts postsynaptic effects. So we get enhanced activity of AMPA receptors and new growth of AMPA receptors. Now with late LTP, this is something that uh, lasts for days or can be infinite. We see uh, increased protein synthesis, so new AMPA and new NMDA receptors, more dendritic spines, so extra bumps on the dendrites that increase the surface area and areas that receptors can bind. And then finally, we also have retrograde signaling. So nitric oxide will increase glutamate release in the presynaptic neuron.
So we'll talk about the implications that these have for different types of learning in the next lecture. And I'll see you then. Bye.